Is it working? No. Is it working? No. How, how good a school does your kid need to go to? How nice does your car need to be? Is it worth it? No. You are destroying the livable climate. Is it worth it? No. You are destroying lives. You are destroying the indigenous people. Is it worth it? No. How much is enough? That's the question we ask you. At what point does human decency enter the boardroom? That's the question we ask you. Never. You've lost your minds. Sociopaths. You are sociopaths chasing the stock market. Remember, you are human beings. We've only been around for 250, 300,000 years. It's the greatest threat we've ever faced. So as you get your bonus, I ask you, is it worth it? No! Is it worth it? No! We have to look at the hard scientific data. Right now, and you won't hear this on the news, zero percent of climate scientists disagree with the fact that we are causing man-made climate warming. And this is the clock. We all should be looking at all of our broadcast news. We have this clock on the lower third. All of our print news should be having this clock. 422 parts per million greenhouse gases. This is it. We need to focus this, man. We're living in a slot machine of titillating distractions and clicks and likes, and it needs to be all about this. Thank you all for coming here today. I appreciate it. Solidarity. And we're back. What's up? I'm Baratunde Thurston, writer, activist, comedian, host of the podcast, How to Citizen. We're making citizen a verb, and yo, we're citizening very hard right now. I've just been speaking with climate champion. I've given him a new title, Bill McKibben, and we're about to be joined by another champion. You may know the writer, director, Adam McKay, from some of his classic hits. I'm talking Step Brothers, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, or some of his more serious political fare, like Vice and The Big Short, or for his latest, one of the most streamed pieces of content in the history of streaming content, AKA The World, Don't Look Up. Adam, you're in the building, what's up? Thank you for having me. Uh, what a great group of people. What an amazing discussion, obviously about the story, the threat, the biggest threat to human life in human history. And we're living through it. And uh, sometimes it's very strange to live in this culture and have everyone just go toodaloo, everything's fine. And we know there is a looming shadow over human life. So to, to join this group and to hear you guys talk and to hear the chief, which was really inspiring, uh, Bill, who's someone I, I've admired for a long time, uh, this means a lot. Well, it means a lot that you uh, helped bring forth something that we needed to hear to people who may not have been in a position to hear it through other means. So on behalf of uh, all humans, which I am now uh, licensed myself to speak for, uh, thank you for, for your work. Uh, can you just explain to us you know, what inspired you to make Don't Look Up in the first place? Yeah, I, I, I had a bit of a turning point in my life, which... I think is the turning point we want a lot of people to have where I went from the somewhat concerned crowd where I thought it was 50 to 80 to 100 years away that we were going to see these devastating effects of uh, the climate crisis. And I was worried. I was involved. And the deeper, the, the, the more I went into it, the more I started realizing the time frame was changing. And in fairness to the scientists, they always told us, we know that the planet is heating. Yeah. We know how it's heating, but the effects are so complicated. We don't know what that will do to the time frame. And I saw that time frame tightening and tightening. So it was the IPCC report from about three or four years ago. And it was David Wallace Wells' book, mm -hmm. uh, Uninhabitable Earth. Oh, terrible, yeah. terrible book. I mean, I mean, I mean, terrible. I mean, it's quality writing. Incredible. It's a terrifying book. You have to read it. If you ever yes. read it, read it, read it. 
Um, and I had three nights where I couldn't sleep. And my wife was like, what's going on? And I went and I checked with, you know, uh, social media is for the most part a hellscape, but there are some good things with it, where, which is where you can talk to a Bill McKibben, you know, a Catherine Hayhoe, you can talk to Alex Steffen, you can talk to uh, these amazing people who really know about this. And I started asking them, am I missing something? It seems like this is now. And all the responses I got were, no, this is now. And then the final thing was my, uh, my sister, my wife's brother, but also my sister up in Oregon uh, had to evacuate her house from the fires. The smoke was so intense. It was like being in Chernobyl. It was a 550 AQI. And there were areas up there that were 800 AQI. And then the during quality, COVID, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't go in my backyard. And I went to full red alarm. I, I, I just kept checking the data. I kept checking the science. And I'm not the greatest mathematician or scientist, but it was so clear. And I was like, all right. I mean, I'm a movie maker, so I got to make a movie about yeah. this weird gaslight culture that we're living in that tells us that everything is fine because they can sell more advertising time because of it. And I was really lucky in that there were a bunch of other people that were feeling the same way. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, the great Meryl Streep, who I think is listening into us. Is, is oh, Meryl's always listening. That's just- <laughs> Always listening. Yeah, she's and, always listening. Uh, and, and Jennifer Lawrence and Jonah Hill and all these people, Tyler Perry, Rob Morgan, all were feeling the same thing. So we made this big, crazy movie for the world. And the response was amazing. It was so the number one, one Netflix movie in Pakistan, Nigeria, Vietnam, Brazil, America, Canada. So it, it was it was terrifying yet heartening, the response to the movie. The, the heartening part, I want to focus on that. Uh, sometimes, you know, we talk about art imitating life or life imitating art, or sometimes it becomes this Mobius strip in which we can't determine the beginning, middle, or end of something because it's just continuous existence. But something that occurred in your film, you had, it's titled Don't Look Up, and there is this movement within the movie, this fictional universe of, yo, just look up, like just, just accept facts. And in real life, uh, we have the emergence of a just look up alliance. Bill, you know, this is something that you have been pushing for, hoping for, I think. I mean, science communication has been in need of boosts continuously. Uh, how did you feel about seeing just to look up and, and, and talk to us about this extraction, this transition, uh, probably not the best to use the word extraction, but this transition from the fictional world to the real world of a movement called Just Look Up. Well, it's a completely fascinating moment, of course. And when something, when a new cultural, when, when something comes along that shakes the culture, that has more, more valence than people understand because the biggest job here the thing that's most important is this shift in the zeitgeist, the shift of what people's sense of what's normal and natural and obvious. And Adam and his crew have already done an enormous amount to do that. But now you don't want to waste the energy. We've used, we've talked a lot about energy today in many different yeah. forms, no, but gotta, this is the most precious energy. kind of energy. Efficient the, use of it, yeah. The most precious kind of energy is human attention, human engagement, human solidarity. And we don't want to waste any of that. So it's really important for to have some vehicles like this just look up alliance of you know people whose um, hearts were cracked open some by by watching this uh, you know so yeah it's it's one more part of this great spreading movement the rebel alliance uh, uh, you know that's that's now in a full on fight with the most powerful forces in the world the big oil companies and the big banks. We do not know how this fight's going to come out, but we know that this, you know, the th kind of work that Andrew Slack and Avaz and people are doing to try and 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 take this hashtag and make it into a, 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 a you know, a, 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 an ongoing thing. Yeah. That's important part of this work. Movements. The only way 
for the for those of us who aren't zillionaires to stand up to the power of oligarchs of all kinds, the oligarchs running Russia, but the oligarchs running Citibank and the oligarchs running Exxon, the only way to stand up to them is to band together. The technology we've got is nonviolent social movement building and the kind of work that Adam's done is a big part of making that real and making that happen. Yo, so I, I... I was shuffling around a little bit because you said Rebel Alliance, and I just had to had to show this off. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I'm with you, Rebel Alliance for real, and, and we're not just talking in theory here. So, uh, hashtag Just Look Up. Uh, please engage with the hashtag. Add your thoughts. Share quotes that are resonating with you, or just check out what other people are sharing and amplify those. But there are also two new social accounts on Twitter. It's Look Up Alliance. And on Instagram, it is just look up Alliance. 